بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. You'll have to excuse my voice just a little bit. It's been kind of struggling since we got back from Umrah a couple of weeks ago. But alhamdulillah, it's a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to be here today, gathered together at this very you know, blessed occasion. We are in the month of Ramadan. We are gathered here uh, shortly before the time of the breaking of the fast. And this is a very sacred time, a time in which prayers are answered, right? This is a time in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the prayers of the fasting people, the believing people. And something interesting about this particular time, if I may digress. You know, growing up um, in a Muslim family, practicing Islam, you have these experiences. It's very common at this time because of the toll that fasting takes fasting takes its toll that when this time comes around we're all kind of a little out of it at that point you know and you're just trying to get by past the time especially these days with having everyone having a device in their hands you're just lost in kind of your device you're just scrolling and we mindlessly spend this time What's beautiful about this gathering is, this gathering has allowed all of us to gather together, sit together, and engage in the remembrance of Allah. Now somebody might say, well, this is not the remembrance of Allah, brother. Remembrance of Allah is, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. No, no, no. There's a hadith of the Prophet where he said, jaddidu imanakum. Renew and refresh your faith, your iman. Okay, Rasulullah. How do we do that? And he said, min qawli la ilaha illallah. Talk about your faith and what you believe. And that's why Imam Bukhari mentions that Abdullah bin Rawaha, a companion of the Prophet, وسلم, an illustrious companion, he would come to the masjid and he would sometimes get a sahabi and he would tell him, Ijlis bina nu'minu sa'atan. Sit with me for a moment, let's renew our faith together. And they would discuss their faith. They would discuss their religion. They would discuss what they believe in. And so, this is a gathering of the remembrance of Allah. Because we're gathered here to talk about Allah, talk about the blessings of Allah, talk about the Messenger of Allah. We're going to talk about the Quran, we're going to talk about the Example, the role model that is Muhammad Rasulullah So this is the ultimate remembrance of Allah. Now, I'd like to go ahead and get right into it so that we can make the most of our time. Through the prophetic lens, I felt what was best to talk about and most appropriate was to talk about something that happened in the life of the Prophet in the month of Ramadan. And that is the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr is such a powerful moment from the life of the Prophet ﷺ that if we as Muslims reflected on it, pondered it, really understood it, and internalized it into our hearts, everything would make sense to us. We wouldn't have any concerns. We wouldn't be worried anymore. We'd still have work to do, but we wouldn't be worried. You ever think about it? The battle of Uhud. It ended in a lot of tragedy. More than 70 Sahaba were killed, shaheed, martyred. So many, hundreds of companions were really badly wounded and injured. The Prophet ﷺ, he himself was badly wounded and injured. It was rough. But the next day, everybody showed up for Fajr in the masjid and prayed. 
They didn't seem worried. The Battle of the Trench. 10,000 enemy. An army of 10,000. Now that might not sound like a lot. 10,000 people were like, oh, you know, that's like Eid at a big Eid Salah. 10,000. But 10,000 human beings together in the Arabian Peninsula a millennia and a half ago is an astronomical number. Let's put it this way. There were not 10,000 residents of Mecca at that time. The population of Mecca was less than 10,000. So more human beings than collectively lived in Mecca at that time got together, showed up outside of Medina to destroy Medina, to burn it to the ground. Now, it was tough. It was a challenging moment. But do you notice how the companions, they're still praying. They're doing what needs to be done. They don't seem worried. You know why they weren't worried? Because they had all witnessed Badr. After Badr, it was impossible to worry. You just never worried. Because you saw that miracles really do happen. You saw that when you put your faith and trust in Allah, Allah will take care of you. Allah promised He will always take care of us. So Badr happened in the month of Ramadan. On the 17th of the month of Ramadan. We're about a week away from the occurrence of Badr. And the battle of Badr, we know the story, the basics of the story. There were 313 companions, and there were over a thousand of the enemy. The Muslims were outnumbered three to one. The Muslims, some of them were holding sticks in their hand. They were going to fight a battle using sticks. And the enemy was armed to the teeth, head to toe, full armor. Swords and spears and bows and arrows and shields, the works. The enemy was so arrogant and intimidating and in your face that they came with the whole party. Like they brought all the celebration supplies with them. Musical instruments, performers, singers, they had all of them with them. And the Muslims could see that. They could see it. That these people have come here planning to dance on our graves. That was the situation. Everybody was lined up to watch this massacre. But before we talk about the battle, there's two things I want to highlight. There are two things that if we understand these two things, what happens next makes sense. First of all, the day before the Battle of Badr, actually, let's rewind, flashback to two and a half years ago. Two and a half years ago before they were there at the place of Badr. The Prophet ﷺ was meeting with the Ansar, the Medinan Muslims. They sent a delegation of over 60 people, their top leaders. They came there to give the oath of allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ. It's called Bay'atul uh, Aqaba, Athaniya. The second oath of allegiance given by the Muslims of Medina. And they came there, and after they gave their oath of allegiance and they said, We're Muslim, they said, We have a proposal. Oh, nobody, the Prophet didn't know that they had a proposal. You have a proposal, what's the proposal? We'd like to propose that you, Ya Rasulullah, and the Muslims, your family, your followers, the Muslims, move to Medina. 
Come to Medina. Make Medina your home. The Prophet ﷺ, when he heard this, he was very excited. He'd been looking, waiting for something like this. The uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, his name was Al-Abbas, he would become Muslim later, he was not Muslim yet. Or at least he had not declared his Islam. Maybe some of the historians write, he was contemplating Islam, but nonetheless he had not declared his Islam. He was there, and so he said, he said, I have to interject. I have to interject here. I have to intervene. What's the issue? He said, you guys, do you think you're planning like a party? A vacation? A sleepover? You're just going to say, hey, come to Medina. And they're going to say, yay, let's go to Medina. And they're going to come to Medina. And yay, everyone's happy and lives ha happily ever after. Do you think that's how this is going to play out? He said, do you not see what's going on here? Mecca has sworn. The Quraysh has sworn that they will end Muhammad. That they will end Islam. That it will not live to see another day. They have dedicated themselves to ending his mission. My nephew, his mission. And he said that we, Banu Hashim, Banu Abdul Muttalib, we, the family of Muhammad, وسلم, we have protected him. We've protected him. Now you might not be impressed with the job we've done, but he's alive, sitting here, talking to you right now. We did this. And many of us don't even believe in his message, yet we defended him. If you take him, Quraysh will become your enemy. And if Quraysh becomes your enemy, all of Arabia will turn on you. All of Arabia will wait for your downfall. So you think very clearly about what you're going to say next. Abbas rained on everybody's parade. He said, this is not the happy moment you dreamed or imagined. This is serious. So he, they conferred. And they came back and they said, we are still just as convinced as we were before that we want to take Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Medina with us. He said, okay, that's fine. But there needs to be an agreement in place. There needs to be some terms agreed to. Because if you don't have terms, there's going to be a misunderstanding down the road. It's like if Abdullah comes to me and says, hey, you know, why don't we rent an apartment together? Okay, let's do it. Yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be great. Alhamdulillah, mashallah, great. But if we don't have some kind of terms that we agree to, who pays for what? Who cleans what? We don't have some kind of terms. What are the ground rules? We're about two weeks away from having a really bad fight. So Abbas said, listen, this ain't my first rodeo. You need to have an agreement. Terms. Have some terms. So they said, okay, they came up with some terms. Here are the terms. Listen very carefully. This is really interesting. They said, okay, if someone who is the muhajirun, the Muslims that are coming from Mecca, if someone is their enemy, pre-existing enemy, or someone is our pre-existing enemy, the Medinan people, the Ansar, if that enemy attacks Medina, because Medina is home to everyone, we all must defend it together. Okay? So, if I have a pre-existing beef with somebody, or you do, that's your problem, this is my problem. But if they attack our home, 
We fight them together. Does that make sense? Number two. But if the Meccan Muslims, the Muhajirun, you guys go outside of Medina to go fight your pre-existing enemy, we the Ansar do not have to come with you and support you. We are not obligated to fight. And if we go outside of Medina to fight our enemy from before, you, the Meccan Muslims, do not have to help us. You don't have to come with us. You don't have to fight with us. You don't have to help us. That's our problem. And everyone agreed to this. Everyone agreed to these terms. And then the Hijrah happened. Does everybody understand? Those were the terms of the Hijrah. Now fast forward two and a half years back to this moment in Badr. The day before Badr. The Prophet ﷺ is sitting there at the place of Badr. And he... So, for the record, for those that might not be familiar, Badr is about a day's journey, like on foot. It's about a day's journey outside of Medina. Badr is not Medina. It's a day's journey outside of Medina. Even in a bus, it takes a good two, two and a half hours to get there. It's far. So, Badr does not qualify as Medina. Now, initially they were going there to intercept the caravan of Abu Sufyan. But then the army from Makkah showed up. And the Prophet ﷺ said, we have to fight this army. We have to stand up to them. We have to fight them. But there were 313 Sahaba. Some of them were Ansar. This is a fight against the Quraysh outside of Medina. Do the Ansar have to participate? No, they do not. Legally, they do not. Religiously, they do not. Islamically, they do not. The Prophet ﷺ agreed to these terms. So the Prophet ﷺ sits down the day before Badr, gathers all 313 companions together, and says, listen guys, this is what's happening. The Quraysh is coming with an army and we have to fight them. What do you think we should do? What are your thoughts? Sa'd bin Mu'adh, who was the leader of the Ansar, he raised his hand. Everyone was quiet. He raised his hand and he said that, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, if I may, I think that you're talking to us. I think that you're talking to the Ansar. You want to know where we stand. You want to know what our thoughts are. And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, that's correct. I'd like to know where do you stand. What are your thoughts? And Sa'd bin Mu'adh, he stood up and he said that we don't have to be here. We have an agreement, a written agreement, terms, that say that we, the Ansar, do not have to be here. But we were lost and you showed us the way. We were without purpose, and you gave our lives meaning and purpose. You reconnected us to our Creator. You gave us something to live for, to fight for. And we followed you to this battlefield. And if you went beyond this battlefield and you walked all the way to the edge of the ocean, we would follow you there. And then if you walked into the ocean, we would follow you there. We will always follow you. We will never leave you. The narration says when the Prophet heard that, his, he was glowing. His face was beaming. The smile on his face, the tears in his eyes. You could see the happiness, the joy. And here's 
the interesting thing. How many of the 313 on that day, how many of them were Muslim? Uh, excuse me, how many of them were Ansar? The 313 Muslims, how many of them were Ansar? Does anybody know? 240. Do you understand? If the Ansar decided to invoke their legal right, their Islamically agreed to right, as agreed to by the Prophet ﷺ, that we do not have to fight here at Badr, and we are going to go home. If they would have invoked that right, there would have been 70 companions remaining. 240 of the 313 legendary Badri companions, Ashabul Badr, were Ansar, and they did not have to be there that day. They did not have to be there. They did not have to fight. That's lesson number one. That Badr teaches us. The life of the Prophet teaches us. Ramadan comes to remind us that spiritual growth, true success, is not in asking the question, what do I have to do? True success is in asking the question, what more can I do? What more is needed from me? Ramadan is not a time. Our history, this ummah, was not built on the foundation of a group of people saying, uh, do I have to be here? Do I have to fight? Do I have to do this? No. Our heritage, our history, our foundation, our tradition was a group of people barely equipped, outnumbered three to one, standing in the middle of the desert saying, what do you need me to do? What, what, is, what is asked of, what, what is needed of me? What is being asked of me? What more can I do? I'm ready. Hadir, Musta'id, ready to go. That's our history. And what happened the next day? Allah's help. وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَذِلَّةٍ That God helped you, aided you at the place of Badr, even though you were weak and outnumbered and overwhelmed, Allah helped you. And what happened? بِخَمْسَةِ آلَافٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُسَوِّمِينَ Allah sent down 5,000 angels from the heavens in waves came crashing down upon that battlefield and gave you victory. Pulled victory from the clutches of defeat. Pulled victory from the jaws of death. And then the second thing, the second lesson of Badr, the optimism that we were talking about, the hope, is the night before Badr. So that was the day before Badr. The 24 hours before Badr is what makes Badr Badr. That's what makes it so special. The day before was this conversation, and these Sahaba willing to say, I'm ready to go. You don't have to. I don't care. I am here to work. I am here to serve. I am here to sacrifice. How may I be of service? And the night before Badr, at the place of Badr today, we were just there two weeks ago, there is the battlefield, and then there's behind the battlefield, there is a huge masjid today, called Masjid Al-Arish. Arish means tent. That is the masjid built at the site of the tent, where the tent of the Prophet was. And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu walks into the tent of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
and he finds the Prophet ﷺ on his knees with his arms stretched out like this towards the sky. He had a shawl on and because his arms were in the air like this for so long, the shawl had fallen off of his shoulders and he was crying and he was begging and he was pleading. Allahumma, in tahlik hadhihi al-isaba, la tu'abad fil ard. Oh Allah, this small ragtag humble group of people, they are the only ones worshipping you as you deserve to be worshipped. And if you let them die tomorrow, if you let them perish tomorrow in the battlefield, that is your decision, oh Allah, nobody can question you. But Ya Rabb, Ya Allah, there will be no one left on this earth who worships you properly. Save them. Protect them. And he begged and cried and pleaded his his old face, his beard, his chest was wet with his tears. His arms were in the sky, like up in the air for hours, begging and crying and pleading. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came in and watched the Prophet ﷺ like this for a while. Until he, tears came into his eyes, looking at the, the begging and the pleading of the Prophet ﷺ. So he finally took the shawl and he put it on the shoulders of the Prophet ﷺ. And he held the Prophet ﷺ from behind. And he said, your dua has been answered, O, o Messenger of Allah. I know, I believe that your prayers have been answered. And then there were angels in the battlefield. That, yes, we are promised victory. We are promised success. But we need to remember these two lessons from Badr. The greatest victory in Islamic history. We need to remember these two lessons. Number one, we have to do our part. We have to be willing to go the extra mile. We have to be willing to get out of our comfort zone a little bit. Make a little bit of extra effort. Number two, and then we have to ask Allah to accept our deeds and to grant us success. That dua, we cannot become reliant upon our own efforts. Our efforts are simply to show our sincerity to Allah, but otherwise we don't control anything, we don't produce anything, we don't make anything happen. Only Allah does. But we need to make a strong effort. Why? Because it proves that we're sincere. A sincere effort and dua. If we do these two things, then the future is ours. The future of the ummah is bright. It's optimistic. It's hopeful. It's beautiful. But we just have to remember these two things. And there's so many examples throughout our history that show us that over and over and over and over again. Somebody made, every community has its story. Somebody made a sincere effort, they made dua to Allah, and the miraculous happens. What you never could have imagined comes to fruition. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to be sincere in our efforts. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always keep, us heart, keep our hearts connected to Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us success in all of our endeavors. May Allah protect and preserve our communities and our families. May Allah grant us great achievements and success for our families, for our communities. May Allah preserve our future generations. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them beacons of our deen, our faith in Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant our future generations the conviction and the faith of our deen and our religion, Islam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our efforts and grant us peace and tranquility in this life and the eternal success of the life of the hereafter. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakum Allah khairan. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to spend this beautiful uh, time with you, this accepted time, this blessed time during the month of Ramadan with you. And may Allah accept from all of us. And I'll hand the mic back over to Sayyidina.